All right, welcome everyone to today's seminar. Uh, today, I'm really happy to have Eric Winter from APL here with us. Today, he will be giving a brief introduction and overview of NumPy, uh, the array uh, module within Python. Um, Eric Winter was a software programmer at Goddard for 23 years and then at STS for five years. And he is now at APL working half time on science and half time as a software in software development. Um, so I'm really happy to have him and all of his experience here today to talk about NumPy. Um, Eric, if you would like to take it away. Okay. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yep. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Eric. Um, what I'm going to do today is give you what amounts to a whirlwind tour through some of the basic features of NumPy. Um, these demonstrations today were based on some NumPy lectures that we gave at a Python boot camp at Goddard Space Flight Center a few years ago. Now, um, before we get started, I want to make sure that um, I'm talking at the right level of detail. I'm assuming at this point that everybody listening um, is uh, pro uh, experienced in programming at least one language, not necessarily Python, but I don't have to explain, for example, what a loop is, an if state, things like that. Um, you've already been introduced to Python itself, so what I'm going to talk about today, NumPy, is an additional set of modules that were made to add on to Python with the capabilities to do efficient numerical computation. Uh, normally in Python, or with, with Python just by itself, if you wanted to, for example, compute the dot product of two vectors, you would write a for loop to loop through each of the pairs of elements. And that works, but because of the way Python is structured, uh, it's sort of halfway between a compiled and an interpreted language. It's kind of like Java. The Python code is compiled into bytecode and then it's run by a runtime engine. So it is flexible, but not efficient computation. NumPy is a large body of code written primarily in C that is then given an interface that it can talk to Python. It essentially gives Python the same sorts of capabilities that you have in more sophisticated uh, science-oriented, math-oriented languages like MATLAB or IDL. Um, if, for those of you who are following along in the CoLab notebook, here at the top I have several reference documents listed, uh, a link to the NumPy website, a link to the, all of the NumPy documentation. It is extensive uh, and well-written, uh, a link to quite a bit of beginner's tutorials for NumPy, and for those of you who are familiar with MATLAB, um, there is actually a document on the NumPy website about how to transition from MATLAB to NumPy. Now again, what is NumPy? It's array computing in Python. What that allows you to do is essentially, instead of, as I said, I said writing a bunch of nested for loops to do array operations, you do it in a single statement in Python, just as you do in MATLAB or IDL. It allows you to create the arrays easily, manipulate them by indexing and slicing. For those of you unfamiliar with the concept of slicing, it's like indexing into array, only it gives you the capability to get out more than one element at a time. One of the biggest time savers that NumPy provides is the ability to compute mathematical functions on an entire array at once. If you had a, an array, for example, that was had six different dimensions and had a total of 100 million floating point numbers in it, you could compute the square root of all of them by just saying np dot square root and pass it the name of the array. You wouldn't have to write six levels of loops or anything like that. Things like that are automatically uh, taken care of for you in NumPy. First and most noticeable advantage this gives us, other than the fact that it's less code that you have to write, is that it's faster. Um, so this first example we're going to look at, I'm going to show you an example of just how much faster NumPy can be than traditional Python. All right, for those of you following along in the collab, scroll down to this, this uh, cell that says import NumPy as NP and hit enter. 
This is the typical syntax used for, for importing NumPy so that when you access things that are in the NumPy namespace, they don't get confused that are with things that are in other Python namespaces. For example, NumPy has NumPy versions of all the standard mathematical operations, as you'll see below. So np.sign computes the sign of a vector of numbers. You don't want to get that confused with the standard Python math version of sign. So we usually keep NP as the namespace to uh, distinguish them. So let's get an example of just how slow for loops can be in Python. Here in this next uh, cell, uh, we're going to create a 100 by 100 array. We have to actually build it row by row with, array, with list operations, and then we're going to uh, compute the value of each element in the array. That's just to give us some data to work with. Now, we want to do a matrix multiplication, not just an element by element multiplication, but actual matrix multiplication as understood in matrix arithmetic. Uh, internally, uh, in matrix notation, that's referred to as an inner product. To do that in Python, it goes something like this. I won't go through each individual line, but you see there's three nested for loops here. Um, Eric, sorry to yes. interrupt. Are you scrolling? It appears that your screen sharing might be frozen. I was scrolling. Um, I'll tell you what, let me try sharing the whole screen again. Okay. Okay, can you see my whole screen? Yep. Okay. Zoom this and get that out of the way. Okay, how's it look now? Yeah, now we can see your cursor move and everything. Okay. As I was saying before, here's a straight Python implementation of a matrix multiplication routine. It has three nested for loops. It's easy to understand, um, but when you run it, it's actually kind of slow. So let's compile that function. And now we're going to time it. I don't know how much experience you folks have had with uh, quote unquote magic functions in IPython, but this uh, syntax here, percent sign and time it, you give, whoops, you give it a function and then it runs that function hundreds of thousands of times and gives you average timing statistics for it. It's extremely useful for quick work. So if we just say time it, that mult x times x x, it's going to compute the inner product of x with itself. That's going to run it. There we go. Okay, it ran it uh, five times, and it said 257 milliseconds per iteration. Now that may seem fast to you. It's less than a second. Now let's do it in NumPy. Instead of this fairly complicated code to manually build the array. In NumPy, we can do it in a single line. We can say np.a range, which gives us a range of integers from zero to whatever we specify. And then we're going to reshape it into a square array. So it looks like this. It's 100 by, that looks like a, yeah, 100 by 100 array. Okay. And now we're going to define a NumPy function to do that inner product. So here, instead of three nested loops, it's a single call, x1 dot x2. The dot function will take care of all of the nested loops needed to do the inner product. We'll compile that. And now we're gonna time that one. Sometimes the time it app can take a few seconds because it might run uh, several more iterations. Okay, in this particular case, the uh, NumPy version took about a second or a millisecond. The straight Python version took about 250 milliseconds. So you got two orders of magnitude speed up right there just by using NumPy for your matrix operations. And that's not unusual. The, the benefits are even greater when you move to significantly larger arrays. Um, also, many uh, capabilities in NumPy are written to distribute themselves properly over multiple cores. And if you've got the right software uh, across GPUs, which gives you even more uh, of a speed up. Okay, in NumPy, the basic object that you'll be working with is what's called an ND array. Um, 
already done the NumPy in, in, uh, import. The ND array is never referred to as an ND array, it's just called an array. You can set to create one, you just call NP array and pass it a list or a nested list or a nested nested list. It can be as arbitrarily nested as you wish. And NumPy will take care of converting that uh, Python array, Python, nested Python object into the appropriate uh, nested multidimensional NumPy array. So we do that. Let's create just a vector one, two, three and convert it to a NumPy array. Print it out and it prints it out right below us. Now, there's lots of convenience functions added uh, to NumPy that reproduce a lot of the capabilities available in other software like MATLAB. For example, if you wanted to create an array containing all unit values, you could just say np.ones. It's named after the ones function in MATLAB. And then you give it a shape. In this particular case, the shape has two elements. Three is the number of rows. Two is the number of columns. And it automatically prints it out nicely in, in a way that, that uh, makes it easier to map the shape to what you expect. It prints it out in three rows and two columns. And here at the bottom, we're actually printing out the shape, the number of rows and columns, because that can be useful in other functions that you're writing. Now, there are other cases like where you want to create an array full of zeros, you could call zeros. And you notice it's actually spelled incorrectly because the plural of zeros is of zero is actually Z-E-R-O-E-S. But because it's called zeros without the E in MATLAB, it's called zeros without the E in NumPy. And there we go, a sort array made of just zeros. Now you'll notice here that we've said int because most of the time when you're working in NumPy, you're gonna be using floating point numbers and that's the default. But sometimes you don't wanna use floating point numbers because they take up much more space than ints. So you can specify the data type as an additional option to almost all of the array creation routines in NumPy. Um, and it even supports complex numbers, just like Python itself does. We specify complex as the data type, create it. And here is um, a complex, excuse me, there was a bug in my face, um, an array created from uh, a complex number in uh, Python right here. And then here, an identity matrix uh, of five elements in each direction. Now, um, I'm going to be going through stuff really fast. So if you have questions, um, go ahead and ask them now. And I will try to uh, answer them as we go, because there's going to be so much stuff that might be difficult to answer the questions uh, at the end. OK. Um, I just saw a question about coffee shop in it. Um, actually, yes, I am. Is the backward, background noise that bad? Uh, we can still hear you. Uh, it's a little bit um, louder than when we had tested. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, well, if it gets bad, uh, I'll see if I can relocate. Okay, another useful convenience function that comes with NumPy when you're setting up problems is the lin space function. That does exactly what it sounds like. Um, you give it a minimum value, a maximum value, and a number of points, and it spits back to you a NumPy array that contains a linear distribution of points in that area. So in cell 14 here, if we call NP lin space minus five to five with 11, it creates a linear distribution of points between minus five and five, and there's 11 points. And there they are. Now, this is slightly different from what you might expect normally in Python, where the last value in an in a index is ignored. For example, in Python, if you do the uh, range operator from minus five to five, it would go from minus five to four. NP lin space explicitly does not do that. It does more what you'd expect. It creates a linear distribution. Um, you can do the same thing for uh, integers here. And you'll see that with a range, it does stop at four. So a range is the NumPy equivalent to the normal Python range operator. So make sure you're you uh, keep that in mind. Typically, when we're doing mathematical work, we want to use lin space as opposed to a range, but there will be cases when you might want to use the other. Okay, 
So at this point, we've seen how we can convert uh, nested Python lists into arbitrarily shaped uh, NumPy arrays. Now, Python stores all the data internally efficiently, just like a C array or a Fortran array. All of the elements of the array are, are stored contiguously to make for efficient fetching from memory. By default, NumPy stores things like C does in a row major order. That means if you've got a five row away array, it stores all the elements of the first row, followed by all the elements of the second row, etc. There are options that I won't go into today that allows you to store in Fortran style, so column major order. And you can convert back and forth between them as needed, which is very useful if you're integrating software written in other languages. Another nice thing about NumPy is it allows you to reshape arrays that you've created. For example, in this first line here, we're going to create an array, a linear array, one dimensional, with six elements in it. We're then going to reshape that into a two by three matrix. We can do that with, in two different ways. We can either set its shape explicitly like this, and I'll print out the array itself here at the end. We're going to convert it into two rows and three columns, just, whoops, just by setting its shape attribute. And when we print out the size, that prints out the uh, number of elements in the array total. The shape is the number of rows and number of columns. So at first, it's just six items in the one array. We then print out the size and it's a total of six. When we reshape it by shaping it to uh, two rows and three columns, the shape comes out as two, three, and that's what we see when we print the array, two rows and three columns. And you'll notice it, it, when it does the reshape, it takes the first three elements as the first row and the second three elements as the second row. So that's what is meant by row major order. Now, uh, any questions at this point? Some of this will be very straightforward and, and well known already to those of you who are used to MATLAB or IDEA. Are there exceptions? I'm reading the question. I think for very large arrays that some arrays can be uh, stored non-contiguously, particularly if they're uh, stored in accelerators like uh, GPUs or, or Intel Psi cards or something like that. I would say for the large fraction of the work that you typically do day to day in Python, you're going to use da data stored contiguously. NumPy has a facility called Views um, that allows you to use a single array and uh, change the way you look at it. For example, you can set up, if we had a million by a million array, so that's 10 to the 12 elements, but we only wanted to worry about uh, every third element on every fourth row. We could set up a view to automatically do the extraction of every third element on every fourth row. And the view would allow us to use, we wouldn't have to duplicate the data and the view allows us to pretend it's that much smaller array. So uh, the as contiguous array option sort of goes the other direction, but at least in my time using Python and NumPy, I've, I've actually never had to use as contiguous array, uh, but the capability is there. Okay, um, so you've seen how to create arrays. You can pass an existing Python list you can reshape it once you've created it. And there's ways to create simple ones like np.0s and np.1s. There's also an np.empty, has the same arguments. Give it a shape and it gives you back an array of the shape that you can then fill in. But it's uninitialized, so it's not zero, it's not one, it's contents are random. For those of you who are familiar with programming in C, it's sort of the difference between the call to malloc and the call to calloc. Malloc just gives you a chunk of memory, no matter what's in it. That's what NP empty does. The call to calloc in C gives you a chunk of memory and sets it all to zero. That's what NP.0s does. For NP.1s, it sets it all to one. 
the empty option is given because it's slightly faster. And if you're creating an array with you know, 10 to the ninth elements in it, the fact that you can create it without initializing it to zero or one can save you uh, several microseconds, which multiplied over the life of a program uh, can save a lot of time. Okay, there is another very convenient way to initialize an array when you create it, and that's initializing it from a Python function. It's not that much different from the functions we've already seen, zeros and ones and empty, and, and that is it's NP from function, you give it a function, and then the shape that you want. That function has to be written in a specific form. It has to take the row and the column index, if it's two dimensional. If it's eight dimensional, you give it all eight dimensions, all eight indices, one after the other. Using those dimensions and the indices in them, you compute what the corresponding value of the array element should be and pass it back. And voila. So what this means is, if this is index 00, zero this is index 0, 01, et cetera, the effect of this is to take this function, my func, and apply it to each of those pairs of elements and use those results in this array. That can be useful for setting up things like uh, grids of values in, in uh, finite difference computations, things like that. Now, let's move on to array indexing. Array indexing in NumPy can be treated exactly the same way as it is in Python. For example, let's create a Python list here. Zero, one, three, four. So we have, whoops, left out a comma. So there we have a, a two-dimensional Python list. And if we wanted to access the individual elements, we would have to say, give it the row number and the column number, each in their own set of square brackets. Now, with a NumPy array like this, we could do the same thing. And it gives us the correct one, row, row one, column zero. But we can also put them together inside a single set of brackets, a one comma zero, and it gives you the same value. So with NumPy, either, either method can be used. However, some of the more advanced features of indexing in Python, I mean, in NumPy, uh, specifically I mentioned slicing, take advantage of the fact that you can do this inside a single set of braces. It gives you very powerful array extraction capabilities. But for now, for simple array operations, either method of indexing can be used. All right. Um, I mentioned above the lin space function. In this case, this line will give you six evenly spaced points in the range minus one to one. And then we can start fancy indexing stuff. Similar to uh, lists in Python, you could provide index ranges. For example, here, we want to set elements two and three to minus one. In Python notation and in NumPy notation, that means we start with index two and go up two, but not actually to four. So we go from two to one less than four or three. So after this line, items two and three will be set to minus one. A minus one, as usual in Python, refers to the la last element in the, in the array. So we're going to set the last element to the first element. And this notation here, the single colon applies to the entire array. So if we say A colon in uh, square brackets to zero, that sets everything to zero. A dot fill with zero does exactly the same thing. And this applies no matter what the shape of the array is. This syntax typically only works with uh, one dimensional arrays, but a dot fill will work with an arbitrarily mentioned array. So let's do a more complicated example here. I'll run it and then we'll step through it. Okay, here we set indices up one, two, and two. We created a two row by three column array. We're gonna print out first row, second column. There we go, 0, 0.0. Now we're gonna print, we're gonna set the, uh, the second row, uh, let's see, IJ, so that's the second row and third column to 10, and then print it out, and there it is. 
and here they show it in both uh, uh, index notations, both the uh, comma separated indices inside of single pair of brackets and the separate square. This is how you would do it in Python, but you can do it in that way or this way in NumPy. When you have multi-dimensions, uh, for example, a two-dimensional array like this, when you have uh, both indices inside the square brackets, you can use colon to represent everything from that particular dimension. So this particular statement here, A colon comma K means every row, but only column K. And here we have row one and every column. And colon comma colon once again means every element in the array. So this is a shortcut syntax that's part of what's called slicing in NumPy. And there are many more sophisticated things that it can do. Uh, I'm gonna show you one uh, in the next cell. Let's create a uh, list of 30 numbers linearly distributed between zero and 29, and then reshape them into a five row by six element array. You see it right here. Now, suppose we just wanna extract a sub array here. So, what we do is put the range of rows that we want, one colon three, which means rows one and two, and uh, the columns are from the, from the beginning to the end, minus one, but stopping before the end. So it would be all columns except the last one, skipping every other column. So this is called, this, this is a triplet of numbers that's referred to as a slice. The first number is where you start. The second number is where you stop. And the third number is how much you skip in between. It's called the stride. So here, again, one to three, we give you the first, and, uh, the second and third columns. And here, blank to minus one gives you every column except the last one, taking every other column. And that's what you get. The capabilities like this, just the capability to do slicing like this, to arbitrarily fetch out subsections of an array is extremely powerful when you're doing uh, matrix heavy operations uh, in numerical work. Uh, and here's another example here where you go from start to finish every third column, uh, third row, from the second column to the last column, every other column. There we go. Okay. Um, any other questions at this point? I'm really only touching the surface of what NumPy can do at this point because we wanted to make sure everybody was familiar with the basics before we try to do anything more sophisticated. I've already discussed slicing to some extent. This next section shows just some more examples of slicing and, and fancy indexing. Now, one thing to keep in mind is when you're doing slicing like this using these uh, multiple indices, in NumPy, particularly when you have large arrays, NumPy does not copy the data if it doesn't have to. Um, for example, if you had an array with 10 to the sixth rows and 10 to the sixth columns, and you're gonna have 10 to the 12th elements, that's a huge amount of data. If, you, if that was referred to as array A, and you said B equals A, it would just make another reference to the array. It wouldn't copy the array. Same thing applies in NumPy. But if you do a slice, for example, if you said A1 and then a colon like this, the data that it returns would be a new copy of the data. So when you're using NumPy with large data sets, you have to be careful about when you're actually making copies and when you're not. And there are utility functions in NumPy to ease that process. For example, you can just say an array and say copy, and it gives you a copy. Okay, one of the best features of NumPy, and one of the things that made it most valuable when this first, the project first started many years ago, is array computations. So if you're doing operations on uh, all the elements of an array, you don't have to write for loops. It automatically threads the computation over all the elements of array. And I think we should still have the array A defined here. Let's check. There. So if we want to multiply this, every element in this array by three and subtract one, we don't have to do a two-dimensional nested for loop. 
we can just say B equals three times A minus one. And NumPy takes care of that for us. This may not seem like a, a big improvement, but just the fact that this cuts three or four lines of code down to one is a huge time saver and a tremendous time saver when it comes to debugging time. Um, any standard mathematical arithmetic operation with Python operators can be done this way. NumPy basically, in this respect, replaces the standard mathematical functions in math and Python with the NumPy equivalents to do this. Um, you can also do in-place operations like, uh, like you do in C and other languages. You could say times equals or minus equals to just multiply all the elements of an array by three and, re and not create another copy of it. Oh, I can, you guys can probably hear the uh, uh, latte being made, sorry. So you can do uh, in, in place operations like that, just like you can uh, in other languages. Now, another very valuable aspect of NumPy is the fact that it gives you vectorized versions of essentially all of the standard mathematical library trigonometric functions, exponential functions, square root, things like that. And they're automatically uh, sourced or automatically threaded over uh, each element in the array. So let's make sure B is defined. There we go. Now, you want to compute the sign of every item in B. Just say NP dot sign B. Boom. Same thing with inverse trigonometric functions. We have NP arc sine B. Um, these are outside of the range zero to two pi, so they're failing. Um, hyperbolic sign of B. We've already seen how operators can work. Here we are uh, raising B to the 2.5 power. Logarithms, some of these will fail because they're negative. No, oh, guess not. Uh, exponential, square root. Uh, a useful ability is clip. What that allows you to do is automatically filter all the elements of the array. And uh, for example, in this case, we're gonna take all the values that are less than minus 0.5 and replace them with minus 0.5. And all the values that are less, that are greater than 0.5 and replace them with 0.5. There probably aren't gonna be many in this particular case. Oh, because that, that was for, okay. Um, you could use this to mask out bad data, for instance. Uh, and when you have a large amount of data collected from instruments. There are standard statistical functions built in, like me, reduces that entire array to a single mean value. Uh, you can also call it as a method on an actual array. So you could say b.var, whoops, or you can call it as a numpy function, np.var of b. Either one works. So that gives you the variance of the array. STD for standard deviation. Median for median. Trap Z gives you a trapezoidal integration across the, uh, oh, it's not gonna work well uh, here, so let me do it. A, a equals N, NP dot lin space 0, 1, 100. Oops. It's expecting a one dimensional array. It does a trapezoidal integration across those values. And NP dot diff of A, Computes the finite differences of all the uh, element pairs sequentially in the array. Now, um, up till now, we've been talking about these ND arrays that are typically created with the ar array is actually not a class in NumPy. It's a shorthand for ND array, just because it's easier to remember. But NumPy also has something called a matrix, which is exactly what you think it is when you hear the word matrix. And in that is basically a mostly convenient wrapper around NumPy arrays to make it more uh, closer to standard matrix notation. Uh, personally, I've never come across a need to use the matrix uh, class. And I've read many instances online where its use is discouraged because it's not standard NumPy usage. But for those of you who want to delve into it, the matrix class is there and it provides similar capabilities to the standard NumPy array. Now, um, the last thing I wanna cover here 
in this whirlwind tour is what are called universal functions. Now, I showed you above how NumPy functions and methods can replace arbitrary sets of nested for loops. You can write functions that take NumPy arrays as arguments that automatically take care of that sort of thing. And that those are called U funks. And you could see an example here. You define the, the function mult one and you it just gives you A times B. So if you pass in A and B as scalars, it'll multiply two scalars together and return you the result. Um, if you pass in a NumPy array for A and B, it'll multiply them together and give you the result. And here's an example of what that looks like when it's broken down. This is, all of this code is replaced by this. And if we then do that with random numbers, okay, I just created the uh, a and B, each one is a random array, 800 by 800. We're gonna use time it again. The random numbers are generated with random.random, .random, which seems redundant, but in Python notation, this means the numpy module, the random submodule, the function random in the random submodule. You give it a shake, 800 by 800, and it gives you that many numbers randomly distributed between zero and one. Now we're gonna use time it again to time multiplying them together using these, the efficient NumPy method. Let's see, 977 microseconds per loop. Now do it the slow way. Three hundred and nine milliseconds. So that's about two and a half about, about a factor of 300 improvement by using NumPy operations. So um, this was a whirlwind tour, but the main things we want you to take away is for doing any kind of serious numerical work in Python, you need to use NumPy or something that is based on NumPy. It's much more efficient in computational speed. It is much, much more efficient in terms of the storage consumed for the numerical values and it greatly reduces the amount of code that you actually have to write because statements, operations that might take a dozen lines of nested code can be done with a single line in NumPy. There are tons of other features to NumPy that I have not even touched on today. And the best thing I would suggest to do if you're not familiar with NumPy is Use the link to the tutorials that's at the top of this, top of this notebook and work your way through them. They're all very well written and very easy to follow and explain things extremely well. Um, the rest of this notebook is a discussion of Matplotlib and I'm not gonna go into that, but Matplotlib, the plotting package for Python, the, the, the basic plotting package for my Python is based on top of NumPy but when you wanna plot values in Matplotlib, you can either pass it a list of Python values or a NumPy array. In fact, almost all major mathematical software in, in Python, whether it's pandas or scipy or things like that, almost all of them are built on top of NumPy and use the NumPy ND array object as their underlying software representation uh, for numbers. And that's about all I can cover today. Um, if anybody has any questions, I can try to answer them. Um, that's it. Okay, I see uh, Kyle put in, to see what methods are associated with the NumPy ND array in Colab, you can use control space. That's what I get for not using Colab, didn't know that. Yeah, Here it go. changes between languages. In most things, it's just tab. So it's yeah. quite confusing in, col in Colab when you try to start hitting tab and nothing works. Um, thank you, Eric, for a really great overview. Um, I would iterate um, Eric's last comment. Uh, going through the tutorials that he posted is really good. They are really quick. Uh, our and very well written. Yeah. Our cola or these notebooks will stay up. Um, in the examples from the tutorials online, you can always just add a cell and run them in the collab to see how they go uh, without actually in, um, 
without actually installing Python. Um, so if we have no questions or no additional questions. Is Eric Pazell, okay, uh, that's old method about the coffee shop. Um, if you guys have any questions about what I presented today, feel free to contact me. You can, um, Kyle, if, if anybody needs it, you can give them my email address. Oh, okay. I, I don't know if it's easily available. Yeah, yeah, I can share it. Um, okay. That's not a problem. So if anyone contact me with questions. I'll just type it in here in chat. Yeah, hello, Kenny. Sorry, I posted a question now. I don't know if you got, uh, thank you. Sure. Please, I have a variable of this one. Okay, I've seen it. Oh, so you're using... Okay, that looks fairly complicated because you're using byte strings. Let me look at that offline and I'll get back to you, all right? That, that, that's not a standard NumPy notation. Um, any other questions? So if there's no one possible, uh, yeah, he's um, saying it's a NumPy string. Uh, so Amadi, uh, Eric will get back to you offline. Um, if you can post your email address in chat, that'll give us an easy way to get back to you. Um, with that, our next seminar uh, is uh, from uh, Subash Adhikari, and he will be discussing a fundamental connection between reconnection and turbulence. Uh, that will be next week, and then the following week will be the long weekend, and we will have a break and then come back with an additional seminar, which I believe will be the early career seminars next. Um, so thank you again, Eric, for um, volunteering or for donating your time after being asked. Uh, this was really great and it was really helpful. Thank you. My pleasure.